Thanks. Thanks, Caitlin. You see it there. Okay, um, take it away, John McGuire. Okay, we all set? Good. Hey, good evening. My name is John McGuire. I'm the Walton High School hockey coach and member of the executive board of Mass State Hockey Coach Association. And uh, normally we're uh, on campus at different co uh, coaches clinics in the fall. And we've obviously adjusted uh, to a webinar system this year. I want to thank ahead of time um, both Paul Moore and Liz Cohen for helping organize uh, our special evening tonight. We have a great speaker and Mike Sullivan and uh, I thank all the coaches for being part of it tonight. And I'm going to turn the show over to uh, Paul Moore, the Falmouth coach, for an introduction to Mike. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, first, I um, want to thank Liz Cohen. Liz, could you just in really quick go over the minutiae of the Zoom with our participants and the Q&A section? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you're going to see that the chat is disabled just to save us all a little time. If anyone has any questions during the presentation, I'm gonna ask you to put it in the Q&A. Um, and that should be at the bottom or top of your screen in gray. You'll see a cool chat box button and it says Q&A. Um, that's where you're gonna put, you wanna put your comments and questions um, if coach doesn't go over them uh, during the presentation. Other than that, uh, sit back, enjoy, and have fun. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. And um, so excited tonight. I uh, want to welcome everybody again on behalf of the State Coaches Association. And we're real, real excited to have, um, you know, one of our own Massachusetts bred uh, head hockey coach from the Pittsburgh Penguins, Mike Sullivan. Mike, uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight and taking, uh, taking your valuable time to talk to the coaches. Um, it's my pleasure, Paul. Uh, okay, thanks. So uh, just... Starting out here, Mike, I just a um, couple questions and a um, little bit about you. Take us through your, your career, Marshfield kid, playing at BC High in the MIAA, going on to play at BU, playing in Bean Pots, playing in front of your hometown, and then obviously into the NHL and then matriculating to a head hockey coach in the NHL. Take us through that, that journey. Well, it was, uh, it, it was fun. You know, I was like every other kid growing up in the Boston area and uh, you had aspirations to play at high levels. And, uh, you know, we had competitive teams at BC High. I, I played with guys like uh, Mark Dennehy and Danny Shea and Brendan Flynn and Paul and Chris Marshall and a lot of these guys that, that went on and, uh, and played pretty competitive hockey and uh, in, in Division I colleges. And I was fortunate enough uh, to get a scholarship to go to BU. I had a great, uh, great experience playing for Coach Parker at BU. And, uh, you know, it, during that, my time at BU, I got drafted, I think, as a freshman uh, and always had aspirations to play in the NHL, but wasn't sure if I was good enough. And so, you know, my mother was always harping on me to, to make sure I got an education in the event that that hockey didn't work out. And, um, I'm sure, uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody on the call has, uh, has, people that influence their lives and help shape them, them as people. And, you know, my parents were a big part of it. My father was a big part of my, my sports uh, careers. And, and, uh, and my mother was always the rock in the family that always pushed us to make sure that we did well in school and, uh, and, and that we were, we were doing the right thing there. So when I, when I took a shot at playing in the NHL, fortunately, I was able to, to find my way. I played, I think 12 years in the league. And, and when I, uh, when I retired from playing, I always knew I wanted a coach. You know, I, I knew that when I was, even when I was going through BU and I think, I think Jack Parker had a huge influence on that. You know, he was, uh, he's a great teacher. Uh, he was a real good practice coach. Uh, j just a great teacher, very articulate guy, charismatic guy. And he had a huge influence on me. And uh, I always felt like it was something that I wanted to do and stay in the game and I just wasn't sure what capacity. I wasn't sure if I was going to be a high school coach or a youth hockey coach or a, or a college coach or, you know, and, and, and I end up back at the pro level. And uh, when, I, when I retired from playing, I was fortunate to have relationships with uh, Mike O'Connell, who was a general manager for the Bruins at the time, and Sean Cody, who was their director of player personnel that when I was playing in Phoenix for the, for the Phoenix Coyotes, Sean Cody was a director of personnel there as well. And I saw him at the Hingham Rink when I was watching my brother Brian play in uh, the Pro-Am League in the summertime there. And uh, 
I was sitting in the corner of the rink talking to Sean and um, my father and I were in the corner watching my brother, my younger brother play. And, and he said, you know, you know, now that you're retired, what are you going to do? Why don't you get, you know, have you thought about getting back in the game? And I said, geez, yeah, I sure, I, I have thought about Sean. I just wasn't sure what capacity. And he said to me, why don't you call Mike O'Connell? Our, you know, we've got some openings in Providence. Maybe you can, maybe you can apply for the assistant job or whatever. So I, I uh, took that to heart. I called Michael Connell and he, and, uh, and I applied for the head job, not the assistant job. And uh, long story short, I ended up getting the head job in Providence and, uh, we had a great, uh, we had a, I had a great time there coaching with Scott Gordon, another local guy that, uh, that played goal at BC and, uh, Scotty and I coached the Providence Bruins, uh, for almost that full season. But during, in that, at the end of that year, Robbie Fatorik had got fired in Boston and Mike wanted me to come up and help him as, as an assistant. And then at the end of that year, he offered me the head job for the Bruins. So I kind of fast tracked. I was, I was one year removed from playing and, uh, and, and, you know, not even a full season coaching at the American league level. And here I am behind an NHL bench at 35 years old. So that was a, that was a big learning experience and uh, uh, not an easy one at that, but, uh, but certainly it was, it was a, a big learning experience for me. And, and then I ended up back as an assistant coach in the league for almost a decade. And, and so until I got the opportunity here in Pittsburgh and uh, I just can't say enough about the experience I've had in Pittsburgh, you know, we were fortunate to, have a great team with some superstar players and, and, you know, when, when in back-to-back Stanley cups might be the highlight of my, certainly my sports life. Uh, it's just, it's changed my life in so many ways and I'm eternally grateful for that. Awesome. You, you, you answered a lot of my questions. You're, you're one year removed from playing pro. You, you spent a year at Providence and then you find yourself a year later, a head coach in the NHL. How hard was that transition going from the American League to the NHL? Well, it was tough. You know, it was tough because I was such a young coach, and I and I think uh, everyone goes through it. You know, just because you know the game, and just because you know you might have played the game at a lot of different levels and uh, played for a lot of different coaches, and uh, you know, when when you're actually uh, when when you've got a when you're the guy that's uh, that's in charge of. Uh, of creating the environment and implementing a game plan and coming up with a game plan and uh, all the decisions that go go along with being a head coach, it's uh, you know it's a, it's an overwhelming experience. And so I, I was I was trying to figure out what what my values were or where my convictions were as a coach, what what was important to me and how, how I was going to interact with players. That was that was part of the learning process. And I was no different than any other young coach that that's, uh, that's approaching the game. And I was going through that process, but at the same time, when you're coaching at the NHL level, I will tell you that the biggest challenge uh, isn't so much the strategy of the game or the X's and O's. It's, it's really about managing people. It's about how do, how do I, how do I manage the star power most specifically uh, to get these guys to buy in? And it's, uh, and, and that's, that's not an easy challenge. And, you know, these guys are the, the best at what they do. They're the elite of the elite. They're the top 1% in the whole world. It's like putting 20 CEOs in one room and they all have healthy egos and they all have strong convictions. And so, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I, I just think that's part of the makeup that's required to have success and play at that level. And so the biggest challenge for an NHL coach, I think it's what separates that league from any other league in the world is just managing the personalities and the better your team is, the more difficult or the more complex that challenge becomes. And so uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve there. You know, you've got to know uh, there's some give and take, you know, you've got to know when to hold their feet to the fire and you've got to know when to cooperate and give them a leash and, and allow them to, to, to express themselves as players because that's what, that's what separates them from others. You know, if you, you guys remember when I was coaching the Bruins, I was 35 years old. I had played with probably six of the guys on that team. Joe Thornton was a rookie, PJ Axelson, Hal Gill, all those guys, they were young when the year I played for the Bruins. So I was teammates with those guys. Now, fast forward X amount of years later, now I'm their head coach. It's a whole different experience, right? And so uh, that was a challenge and it was a great learning experience for me. But, uh, but, but for me, that, that's the biggest aspect of coaching at, at the level that I'm at. But I, I would almost argue that it, I don't care what level you're at, it, a, a big part of coaching uh, is about managing people. 
It's about interacting with people so that you can inspire a group or you can inspire individuals to be at their best. And, uh, and that's the human aspect of coaching, right? There's the science of coaching. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight, but there's also the art of coaching. And that's really about the, that's the human aspect, right? It's the, it's the give and take. You, you can't treat everybody the same way. It's not that you have double standards, but everybody's personalities are a little bit different and it's understanding how do I push those buttons? Some guys I can lean on, other guys I got to make sure I give them a hug. And so, you know, it, it's, it's trying to figure out all those personalities on your team and how do you maximize that group? That's the biggest challenge. Excellent. You, uh, just to backtrack a second. So you mentioned Jackie Parker, who's, you know, in these areas is just the wild. How important was he for you as a, as a role model and someone that you leaned on after you left BU? Well, he's, uh, he was really important. I, I, I remember he was one of the first guys I called when I, before I took the Providence Bruins job. And, uh, I, and, and I called him to seek his advice. You know, I, I, him and I have a real good relationship. I had a great experience playing for him. You know, to this day, I will tell you, he might be the best coach that I ever played for. And I played for some real good ones at the NHL level. Uh, but that, that just tells you what I think of Jack and, and uh, the type of coach that he is and, and the type of person that he is. He really cares about his players, you know. He was never warm and fuzzy, I'll tell you that. But, <laughs> uh, but when... when uh, when I was taking the, when I was going to take the Providence job, I called him to seek his advice and ask him what his thoughts were. And the first question he asked me says, he goes, let me ask you a question, Mike. He goes, what, what do you want to get into coaching for? And he tried to talk me out of it. And I said, well, I want to be around the game. I love it. And, you know, but he, he kind of shared the realities of coaching with me. Well, it's a hard profession. It's a hard business. There's a finite amount of positions. You know, you want to coach at the NHL level. There's only 30 head coaching jobs in the league. And so there's only 30 guys that have that privilege, right? You, when, you, you, when you take it down to Division I colleges, how many, how many Division I college programs are there? There's a, there in, in other words, his point was there's a finite amount of positions. It's not an easy profession. You better make sure that you really love it and this is something that you really want to do. And I'm glad he asked me the question because it just, it, you know, when I, when I was finished with the conversation, you know, I, I went back and gave it some more thought and, talk to my dad and, and my wife and, and, uh, and the pe the other influencers in my life. And, uh, and said, is this something, is this a road I really want to go down? And, uh, obviously it was, I love the game. I have a passion for it and, and I've been at it ever since, but you know, I, I lean on Jack. I still lean on him to this day. I, you know, I talk to him a handful of times throughout the course of the year. And, uh, you know, I call him sometimes when I have some difficult coaching, uh, dilemmas, uh, and, and I seek his advice and, uh, you know, there isn't too much that he hasn't been through as a, as a coach, you know, you think about his tenure at BU. I want to say he was there close to 40 years and he's coached some really, really good players, guys that have gone on to, to, uh, you know, to Olympic teams and NHL, uh, careers. And there, there's been, there's been, there hasn't been much that Jack hasn't seen or been through as a coach. So, so when I call him and I, and I share the, the dilemmas that I'm going through, he's a great sounding board for me, and he still is to this day. Oh, that's great stuff. The, you know, being a mentor, which we all are in our own way, but it's, it's great that you still have that connection all these years later. Well, your, your PowerPoint's up, Mike. I'm really looking forward to um, this presentation. It's all yours. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so when Paul asked me to, to, uh, to speak to you guys, he asked me to talk on practice planning for the modern game um, you know, that you can see the title of my, of my PowerPoint here, just creating a training environment to succeed in the modern game. It's a little bit more than the practices, but we'll try to focus on, on the actual practices and some of the things that I think are important that, that, that to give you guys some things to think about, uh, when, when you leave this, uh, you know, this, uh, clinic tonight. So, uh, I'll do my best. I know there's some interaction here with some Q and A's if it shows up, I'm not a great IT guy, but I'm, I'm learning this IT stuff in this, in, this new, uh, in this new world that we all live in with the pandemic. So I'll do my best to try to keep it as interactive as we can. So you, I would encourage you guys to use the Q&A tool. And, uh, and like I said, I'll try to, if I can't get to it during the course of, of uh, the PowerPoint itself, then I will, uh, I'll, I'll try to leave some time at the end for some Q&As, okay? I've kind of broken this, this PowerPoint up into a number of different parts. 
the, 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 the last part is, is really going to be a, a, a resource or a reference for you guys where I've got a number of different uh, drills that we use in, in Pittsburgh with our guys and different types of drills. And I'll explain that to you when, uh, when, when I go through the PowerPoint. But we may not get to all of those things, but I've given Paul this PowerPoint and uh, talked to him about uh, if you guys want to use this as a reference or look at some of these drills, uh, we'll certainly try to make that happen uh, after the fact. So I probably won't get through the whole thing, but uh, I'll try my best to get through the bulk of it to give you guys an understanding of, of what I'm trying to get at here. So um, let me see if I can advance this slide. Here we go. So so for me, th this is what I set out to try to accomplish when I was building this, uh, when I was building this PowerPoint, okay? The first thing I thought it would make sense to start was just to identify sought after qualities of an elite player. So th this is just something, and I'm really gonna touch on this very briefly. We could talk about this for, for hours, but I'm just gonna tough on it, to touch on it briefly tonight, just about it, in Pittsburgh, when we get in our personnel meetings and our, and our scouting and our hockey ops discussion, some of the things that we value uh, with our players. I think it's an important starting point because as coaches, these are the, these are the aspects that we're going to try to develop in our players. Okay. We're, we're going to talk about practice planning as being a part of it, but I, the first part of the discussion, I think we should take a step back and then just talk a little bit about skill acquisition and how learning takes place. This is something for me that I don't think coaches talk enough about, you know, we all want to get into the drills and the details of practice and talk hockey, but you know, in essence, we're teachers, right? And so it, I think it makes a lot of sense to think about uh, or give some thought into, into how people learn. And so this whole idea of brain-based learning is something that I've read a lot about, research a lot about. I've had discussions with a lot of people in my life around it that, that have more knowledge of this stuff than I do. And I'm going to share some of that with you in this PowerPoint. Okay, the other thing uh, that I wanted to discuss was decision making, and, it, and it's a big part of invasive games, is, is the decision making aspect of, uh, of our game. I would argue that, that it might be the most important attribute as a player is just, you know, decision making manifests itself in game sense, right, is, is your ability to, to, to uh, process the game and then make the appropriate decisions at the, at the right time. So, so we'll discuss a little bit about the science of decision making as well. Then we want to, based on that knowledge of some of the science that I'm going to bring you, we're going to try to identify some co coaching methodologies that reflect some of that, that knowledge that we, so we can leverage some of that knowledge. And, and, and so if we, can, if we can talk about some methodologies and strategies that we can utilize in practice, I think that's going to, that's, going to, that's going to help you guys or at least challenge you to think outside the box a little bit. And the last aspect is we're going to talk about the, the, how it plays out in practice. We're going to talk about practice planning and then training for the modern game. Okay. So that, those are my objectives. So the first part for me, and, and I think these are obvious, but this is something that we talk a lot about it in Pittsburgh is, is what is it that we value in players? And, uh, and, and I put these in prioritizing order. Uh, every player is going to have a recipe of a makeup of these four categories. And it's that, it's that recipe of strengths and weaknesses in those categories that make up the composition of the player. And inevitably, we ask ourselves a question, well, can this guy play? And given the, given the recipe that this guy has, can he play for the Penguins? So for me, competitive spirit, I think, is something that, uh, that goes without saying, right? We, we want competitive guys. We want guys that have a will to win. And so, and that manifests itself a lot of ways in the, in the game, whether it's in one-on-one -on -one battles or net front play or wall play or the ability to play through fatigue or things of that nature, right? So for me, competitiveness in my mind is a foundational attribute that we look for in our players. The next one is functional intelligence. And that's the game sense that I was talking about. You know, a player's ability to, to, uh, to process the game on both sides of the puck, I think, is a, is, is a critical aspect of a player's ability to have success. The question that I'm going to ask you guys tonight, and we're going to discuss it a little bit, is, is can you develop that? Can you help players get better at that aspect of the game? Uh, the next part of it for us that we value is speed. And speed takes on a lot of forms, right? There's, uh, there's physical speed and foot speed and things of that nature. But there's also mind speed, your ability to, to process the game in a timely fashion. There's team speed, 
your ability to change the point of attack by passing and receiving skills, and then, and then concepts within your team game that allow you to work collectively as a group so that you can improve your team speed. The, the, the puck moves faster than any one guy can skate. So a team players and teams that have the ability to move the puck uh, can present themselves as, as being a fast team. So speed is a, is a for me, is an, the ultimate competitive advantage. And that's a discussion we have in Pittsburgh all the time. And then the last one is just uh, puck possession skills or puck skills. You know, it's passing and receiving. It's your ability to shoot. It's puck protection. It's all of those, those physical aspects that revolve around playing with the puck. These, for me, are the foundational skills that we look for and we value in our players. So, so the, the, the inevitable question that I would ask you guys is, as coaches, it's our job to try to help our players develop and grow in these aspects of their game. And how do you do that? That's the discussion that we're going to try to have. So these two books I'm going to discuss a lot about in the first part of the, uh, the, first part of the PowerPoint. The first one's The Talent Code. And, and in, that, in, in this book, it talks a lot about the science of skill acquisition. And uh, we did some stuff during the stoppage and play with the, uh, with the Cleveland Indians organization with uh, Terry Francona and, and my staff. And, and we were kind of, we had a bunch of Zoom calls and we were trying to uh, challenge one another to, to, be, to become better staffs by just kind of reaching across sports and, and seeing what, you know, what are they doing in baseball that we might be able to learn, learn from? And what are we doing in hockey that, that maybe uh, Tito and his staff could take, take to Cleveland? But I, I was uh, one of the guys that works as a consultant for Cleveland is this author, Daniel Coyle, in this book, The Talent Code. So I had a great opportunity to get to know him a little bit. And, uh, and th th that book was a game changer for me. It's, it, for me, that, that should be a must read for, for any coach that has any sort of passion uh, to be good at what we do. And then the other one is this book, The Playmaker's Advantage. And that's about decision making. And that's, uh, this one's written by Dr. Len Zakowski, who was one of my professors at BU. He was a sports psychology professor for almost 40 years at BU. Uh, but he's worked a lot in the pro game as well. He's worked for the Calgary Flames. He's worked for the Vancouver Canucks. We have since hired him in Pittsburgh. He works for us right now with a former Navy SEAL and he heads up our our uh, performance coaching aspect of our, of our uh, uh, coaching staff that, that we put together as resources to try to help our players become their best. But Doc Z is at the cutting edge of this stuff. And, uh, and his book, I think, is a great read. And we're, I'm going to point to a few things in, uh, in this first part of the PowerPoint today. But for me, if I could suggest anything to you guys, if you take anything away from this PowerPoint, these two books, in my mind, are a must-read for any coach that's serious about what they want to do and, and how, they want to, uh, how they want to become the best coaches they can be. So in the Talent Code, they talk a lot about the science of skill acquisition. How does it take place? And this is the whole idea of brain-based learning, okay? And in the Talent Code, they talk a lot about, uh, they talk a lot about myelin. And myelin is a neural insulator that, that ends up wrapping neural fibers as as your brain as your brain learns and, and starts to wire, okay? And a lot of neurologists consider myelin to be the holy grail of skill acquisition. So here's kind of what it looks like. Uh, and, and in this book, it, as, I, as I said, they talk a lot about this, the myelin's role in the brain and how it helps in the, in the uh, acquiring skill, both physical skills and mental skills for that matter. The brain doesn't decipher between the, between the two. So, you know, every human skill is created by chains of nerve fibers carrying a tiny electrical impulse. As a, a, the signal travels through the circuit, myelin's role is it wraps that circuit with an insulator, and th that insulator is the myelin. And, and, you know, we talk in sports a lot about muscle memory. Well, muscle memory really takes place in the brain. It's really not muscle memory. It's myelination is what happens. The more the nerves, uh, you know, they fire till they wire, once they wire, the myelin's roll uh, comes in and it starts wrapping that neural, neural insulator so that we create automacity and instinct in the skills that we're trying to acquire. So this is an important element of, of how skill takes place in our brain. And this is the premise of brain-based learning, right? So when we fire our circuits in a certain way, whether it's we practice swinging a bat or playing a note on a, on a uh, piano, our myelin responds 
by wrapping layers of insulation around the neural circuit, each new layer adding more skill and speed. The thicker the myelin, the better it insulates, the faster the, the pathway. And that's how automacity and instinct takes place. So what good athletes do when they train is they send these, these precise impulses along wires that give the signal to myelinate. And then inevitably what you end up with is you end up with a super duper uh, uh, highway in your brain where you've got lots of bandwidth to, to draw an analogy to, uh, to IT network. So, so let's talk a little bit about, about the, the, the theory on how it takes place, right? And, and it, it brings me to this German proverb, you, you'll become clever through your mistakes, right? In, in, this, in uh, Daniel Coyle's book, he, he talks with a lot of, of psychology people and neuroscientists that study this stuff all around the world. Well, one of the guys was this guy, Robert Bjork, the chair of psychology at UCLA. And what he talks about is, uh, is the more that we generate impulses encountering and overcoming difficulties, the more scaffolding we build. The scaffolding is the myelination. So the object when we're creating a learning environment is to find a sweet spot where we choose a goal just beyond our abilities. So we're targeting the struggle, right? That's an important takeaway. We don't want, we don't want to overwhelm our players, but we, we, want to, we want to try to challenge them at the limits of their ability. And if we do that, mistakes are going to be made. So once again, purposely operating at the edge of your ability, you know, uh, targeting a mistake focused practice is effective in, the, in, in acquiring skill. The best way to build a good circuit is to fire it, attend to mistakes, fire it again over and over. So it, is, it inevitably is, it's trial and failure until it becomes trial and success, right? The struggle isn't an option, it's a biological requirement. In the book, they talk a lot about, uh, about uh, childlike learning, right? It's like how a child learns how to walk. You know, it's through he his brain takes, his or her brain takes in stimuli through, uh, through his or her eyes and, and uh, either it's visual or auditory, then their brain fires and maybe they take a few steps, they fall down, they take a few steps, they fall down, they take a few steps, all of a sudden they start to gain their balance and now the myelination process takes place, right? That childlike learning is brain-based learning. That's what we're talking about. So there's a struggle associated with that. That's a really important takeaway for coaches because how we react to mistakes is really important if we're going to encourage the learning process to continue and to develop. So our challenge is, is we've got to target the struggle. We've got to try to find the sweet spot where we're challenging the comfort zones of our players. So the, the other aspect of brain-based learning is they talk about this idea of deep practice, right? And deep practice is built on this paradox that struggling in certain ways, right? Operating at the edges of your ability where you make mistakes makes you smarter, right? So overwhelming people isn't, isn't necessarily effective because it can be discouraging and may turn them away from the sport, right? So thrashing blindly doesn't necessarily help, but reaching does. So targeting the struggle is an important aspect of what we do in coaching, okay? So now let's talk a little bit about decision-making, right? And this is Doc Z's book on, on how to raise your mental game. And in, in his book, he talks about the playmaker's genius, right? What separates the Sidney Crosbys and the Evgeny Malkins and the Patrice Bergerons of the world from others, right? It's consistently doing the right thing at the right time in the right situation that captures the essence of the game, right? That, that, that in, in essence, is the playmaker's genius. Well, in Doc C's book, he talks about a lot about the cognition loop. And this is what your brain goes through when you're making decisions in sports or whatever it may be. There's a search mode, there's a decision mode, and then there's an execution mode. And, and that's what your brain goes through. So at the core of, of every decision is a goal. Nothing happens in sports without intentional and movement. So it's the goal that drives the cognition loop. Now, there are certain things that take place when an athlete is making decisions in an, in, in an invasive game, an instinctive game, like hockey or lacrosse or 
basketball or soccer, things of that nature, right? And, and so we talk a lot about anticipation and, and, uh, and uh, uh, awareness, right? Things like that. And so a, a lot of that takes place at a subconscious level, right? And so what happens is your brain, uh, it, it takes in cues that it takes in visually, it takes it in auditorily, it takes it in somatically, whether it's a feel, right? It's a sixth sense that athletes have where they can feel things with that they can't necessarily see it or hear it. That's the somatic aspect. But there's certain cues that, that athletes, that the brain takes in. Some of them are conscious, some of them are un, uh, unconscious, and that's how decisions are taking place, right? And then there's pattern recognition. So what happens is over the course of time, your brain builds up certain patterns in, in, uh, that, that they sock away in memory, and then they recall that when they're making those decisions. So for example, players that are in a certain circumstance, they would expect people to be in certain areas of the rink just based on those pattern recognitions, right? And you guys know what I'm talking about when, uh, when I'm talking about that kind of thing. So sometimes players may not see it, see a guy, but they can put the puck to a certain area because of that pattern recognition and that cue utilization that might take place at a subconscious level. So that's how the decision making is taking place in your brain, okay? The, the, the other thing I, uh, that, that's a similar analogy, and I'm not sure if you guys are aware of these two guys, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, but they, they wrote that book, Thinking Fast and Slow. These guys are behavioral psychologists from Israel, and they, they're, they're two of the most uh, foremost cutting edge guys when it comes to behavioral psychology. And they study decision making a lot. And, and they, they share two systems, or they use this analogy in their, in their book, and they call it system one and system two. And system one is your automatic system, right? It takes place at a subconscious level. You know what two plus two is, uh, you know, without even thinking about it. A fastball comes at your head and your body reacts a certain way to get out of the way, right? And it's, it's just, it's based on pattern recognition built up over, over the course of time. There's certain cues that your, that your brain takes in. Uh, it takes place at a subconscious level. It's instinct, right? And, and that's system one. System two is slow, effortful, conscious thought, which is also part of the learning process, right? We can, we can figure out what 17 times 234 is, but we just can't rattle it off like we can two plus two, right? So the same thing might, might be the case when you're trying to learn how to cross over or you learn how to, how to take a one-timer or you learn how to hit a baseball, right? It might be slow and effortful at first, but over the course of time, that as your brain starts to learn through the skill acquisition process that we talked about, then there's a transfer going from system two to system one, right? And that's how, the, that's how uh, decisions uh, are, are made and that's how skill acquisition takes place. So uh, Kahneman and Tversky did a lot of studies on under what conditions can you trust intuition or instinct, right? When can you trust your instincts? And in hockey, we talk a lot about trusting our instincts in sports for that matter, right? Well, through their studies, they, they came up with a criteria where your instinct can be trusted, right? And, and the criteria is a high validity environment where stable relationships between objectively identifiable cues and outcomes of possible actions take place, okay? So that's where in a high validity environment, people can trust their instincts, okay? Sports offers a high validity environment. There's rules of the game, there's immediate consequences, there's measurable outputs. So through the deep practice process, system two can provide an opportunity to develop a cause and effect relationship that will eventually transfer this stuff to that system one where it's automatic, where it's instinct, it's automaticity, and it takes place at a subconscious level and you don't have to think about it, okay? So it might be a breakout. It might be things of that nature. It might be the individual skill aspect or taking face-offs, right? It might be slow and effortful at first, but eventually over practice time and time again, it turns into uh, subconscious thought, okay? So for me, this is an important aspect. And now I'm going to talk about the actual, based on that knowledge, so what kind of strategies can we utilize in, in, in coaching that we can leverage this, okay? 
So in the playmaker's advantage, okay, they talk a lot about uh, skill execution under pressure. Matter of fact, they, they, come up with, uh, they come up with a definition of skill, and that is, uh, that is the very thing, execution under pressure. And so this, this person, Damian Farrow, is a professor of skill acquisition in the Institute of Sport uh, at the Victoria University in Melbourne. Okay, they've done a lot of studies on skill training for instinctive games. Okay, and what they've come, what what their studies have have shown was that uh, random repetition of tasks versus a block training environment helps an athlete develop adaptations, so the transfer of a skill is most effective. Okay, so they use the analogy with Dr. Seuss, you know, and every we're all familiar with Dr. Seuss's books like I do not like green eggs and ham, right? There's 50 words, Dr. Seuss uses rhyming phrases that repeat the same 50 words, but they switch them around, then they, they take you back to the same repeat and rhyme so that you can remember, right? It's manipulating cognitive load to an optimal challenge point. Well, the same principles apply to physical skills in coaching. So we want to develop methods where we train skill uh, and, and to prepare athletes to maintain technique where, where there's execution under pressure, right? There's another professor at, uh, at the University of Australia. His name's Alan Lounder. He wrote a book called Play Practice. That's the whole idea of small games, right? It's, it, it's alignment. It's skills taught under the demands of the real game where the transfer of the skill can be most effective. And so we want to try to create an environment as often as we can where we're training skills under the demands of the real sport. The closer that we can get to that aspect in, in our practice environment, then the players are going to, uh, they're going to have an opportunity to acquire those adaptations that are necessary so that the transfer of the skill will be effective in a game environment. If all we do in practice is set up a false environment with no resistance, five on O's and flow drills or whatever, that's a false environment, then the transfer is, is gonna fail under the demands of the real game. You know, and, and, and I, always, I always go back to, you know, youth hockey and, and parents all the time, they, they love organization, right? Parents think it's a great practice if there's guys in line and there's order and, uh, and nobody's shooting pucks against the boards and there's, there's a lack of chaos. Well, when you think about the nature of hockey and how it's played, it's muddy, it's ugly, it's imperfect, right? There's an element of randomness and unpredictability associated with invasive sports because you can't always control what your opponent's gonna do. Sometimes you can't even control what your line mate's gonna do. You'd like to think you've got a team concept where you can be somewhat predictable for one another. But once again, people are gonna act on their instincts. You know, the nature of our game is it never plays out in the real game, how we draw it up on the dry erase board. So these guys aren't robots. So we've gotta, we've gotta make sure we prepare them for that type of environment, right? It's a random environment, it's chaos. So it's the difference between learning a skill versus performing a skill. You can learn a skill in, in the absence of fatigue, in the absence, absence of pressure, and that's where isolation takes place, right? And, and there's a time and a place for isolation of skills. We just can't get stuck there. And we can't, the majority of what we do, we have to graduate and try to train that skill in a real environment, under the demands of the real sport, with pressure, a little bit of fatigue, things of that nature involved, right? So, so now, the brain can start to acquire the adaptations that's necessary so that that transfer of that skill will be effective in a game. You know, I liken it to learning a one-timer. You know, if all I do is I feed a guy one-timing pucks with no resistance or nobody sliding out at the guy or, you know, maybe the puck isn't in the guy's wheelhouse, if I give him a perfect pass every time, what happens when it's off his front foot? What happens if the puck is bobbling? What happens if in a game, somebody's sliding out to block the shot and he's got he's to shoot high, right? So there's all different types of adaptations that are required for that skill in a game. So if all we do is train it in a false environment, we're setting up that player to fail, okay? And that's what this is talking about, right? It's learning a skill 
versus performing a skill. And there's a significant difference. So once again, getting back to strategies and what we're going to try to do in practice, you know, they talk a lot in Doc C's book about specificity, the degree to which the training task matches a skill that will be required in competition. They use the term representative learning. You, we can use constraints to squeeze the skill into tighter time and space. And once again, I'll go back to the small game environment, right? We don't necessarily change fundamentally how the game's played, but we can, we can confine space so that things might happen quicker, right? Which might create more opportunity to acquire skills. If you can find space, there's more touches, puck touches, for example. So, you know, maybe a player has more of an opportunity to learn how to protect the puck or learn how to receive a pass because he's getting more opportunities because we're squeezing the skill into a confined space, right? We're, we're not necessarily changing the environment fundamentally of how the game's being played. It's still a function of time and space. We're just squeezing the, we're, we're just squeezing the constraints, right? And that's the idea of representative learning. It's specific in nature, but we can manipulate it to try to create challenge points where we can challenge comfort zones and we can target the struggle, okay? So we want to learn from our mistakes, but we want to be motivated by our success. If we overwhelm our players and they never feel success or they never experience success, then they're going to be discouraged. And that's not necessar necessarily a good thing either. You know, we, and, and, you know, like part of that is the discussion you can have with players between whether they're on the varsity or on the JV, right? Some guys, hey, you might be better served playing a year at the JV level. It's not a bad thing. It gives you an opportunity to be a more dominant player and you can acquire more skills so that when you do get to the varsity level, you've got an opportunity to have success. We have the same conversations with our guys, whether we deal with the American League or playing in the NHL. And that's a, that's a fundamental we discussion we have with with a number of our guys every single year. Are we better served keeping a guy at the NHL level, playing limited minutes in a limited circumstance, or are we better served let, allowing that guy to develop at the American League level where he's playing 20 plus minutes a night and he's in all the, all the key situations, right? A lot of it is, is that that's part of the development process. So th th this, is, this is the methodology and the strategy that we're gonna try to utilize in our, in our practice environment. I'm gonna show you some examples in real terms on how we try to do it in Pittsburgh. So a lot of it is based on a lot of this science and research that has been, that, that, that I've gone down this rabbit hole for the last 20 years in brain-based learning. You know, I, I, there's, there, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ways that we as coaches develop our philosophies, right? And like the question I would ask you guys is what's your knowledge base? What does it stem from? Well, it's your playing experience. It's guys that you played for, right? That have had an influence on you. Like for example, I talked about Jack Parker, but it's, it's your playing experience. It's coaches that you've played for, but where else is it? There's a big world out there. Some of you guys might've just played in high school, never had the opportunity to play in college or whatever. Some of you guys might've only played for two or three coaches in your life. You know, I probably played for I don't know, maybe a dozen coaches in my life. And, and I ended up playing 12 years in the NHL. And, and I've taken a little bit from all of those guys. And they all had strengths and weaknesses in their, own, in their own right. But there's a whole big world out there where we can expand our knowledge base. And, and so one of the things I would ask you is, is, you know, and I hope maybe in this early part of the PowerPoint, some of the things that I'm talking about will kind of challenge you guys to think about, hey, how else can I learn about this stuff so that I can try to, I can try to, uh, to shape and evolve my convictions and my philosophies as a coach on how I, what kind of an environment that I create. So this is, what I, th this is the process that I've gone through for the last 20 plus years that's going to take me to where I am now. So let's talk a little bit about training for the modern game. Well, this is, for me, I call it the Penguins way. This is our philosophy as a coach and staff in Pittsburgh. Uh, and we've enjoyed a little bit of success. Uh, it's fortunate, you know, like, like Jack Parker said to me when I first started taking, uh, decided to get into coaching, he said, hey, Sal, you know, you know what makes great coach, uh, you know what makes great coaches? I said, what's that coach? He says, great players. And he's not wrong. This is a player's game. And I'm fortunate to have the, to have the opportunity to coach 
the guys that I coach in Pittsburgh, sometimes they make me look a whole lot smarter than I actually am. These guys are, are brilliant players. They're great people. Uh, no, nobody's better than the guy that you see holding the Stanley Cup there in Crosby. He's the standard for us. So let's talk a little bit about what our, our Penguins way in, in Pittsburgh. So for me, we talk with our guys a lot about control and the controllables, right? And so we focus on the process a lot. And, and, and for me, you know, the controlling the controllables start with these three things, your attitude, your effort, and your execution. And we're going to demand that every day for each and every one of us. You know, you get up in the morning, you make a conscious choice on how you're going to attack the day. So when you're brushing your teeth and you look in the mirror, make the right choice. Come to the rink with a positive attitude. Hey, it's not always apple pie and ice cream, right? Maybe the coach isn't playing you the way he wants him to you the way you want to be played. Maybe you're not on the first power play. You're not the first defense pair. You know, I get that. That's the human aspect, but you've got to overcome that because you're part as a team, you're part of something that's bigger than you as an individual. So for me, this is where we start in Pittsburgh on, with these three things. And we try to lead by example as coaches. So when I talk to our coaches, we talk a, a lot about this, our teaching philosophies, right? And, and, and I point to this Socratic method, you know? And, and it's, it's asking a lot of questions. It's engaging our players. It's encouraging their, their, uh, their input and their insights into the process. So I'm telling my coaches all the time that we don't want to give them the answers. We want to help them discover the answers, right? It's the most powerful way we learn. We want to take them through a process and we want to try to facilitate that process as the coaches. So as a coach and staff, we spend a fair amount of time talking about our coaching, our teaching style, you know, our, the vocabulary we use, how do we approach that with our players? Let's not just give them the answers. So once again, our philosophy is we want to create an environment where our, our players are encouraged to problem solve because in essence, that's the game, right? We encourage their participation. We give them a stake in the game. In our video meetings, I use the term, I've tried to create what, what I use the term as a safe zone. And I talk about that with our coaches. So I don't use our video meetings in Pittsburgh as a means of accountability. In other words, I don't go in there and where players are on eggshells, like, oh my God, I, I hope I'm not on the film because if I am, I could be humiliated or whatever. Or, you know, I, I try to use it as a learning experience and a learning opportunity. So our video sessions, by conscious thought with the coaching staff are trying to be in the absence of, um, uh, in the absence of uh, nervousness with our players, right? Because we want them in the right frame of mind where they're receptive to the learning process and they're engaged in the process. They're not worried about, oh, am I gonna be the number one star on the film today? So I use other ways to hold them accountable. I don't use the film sessions to hold them accountable I use it as, like I said, as a safe zone. And I do that on purpose because I think it's an important part of the learning process. So I don't want anxiety to be part of that environment. And so I'll create anxiety other ways. I don't, and that's part of, you know, like I get it. Accountability is a part of what we do as well. And, and that's, the, that's a topic for another day. But for the sake of teaching and, and the learning aspect, we don't use our video sessions as a form of, a, of accountability. I would encourage small groups. What I find with my guys is when sometimes we show the same film, but we break into four groups or, or three groups or two groups, whatever. We make the group small. And the reason is because we're trying to encourage interaction with our players. We want them to participate in the, in the video sessions. So sometimes we don't do it all the time, but sometimes we break into small groups. We try to do it at least once a week so that we can encourage participation. Special teams, we do it a lot. And that way we can encourage them in the process, okay? On ice, we're trying to create a game real environment. We practice how we play. We're gonna to try to create drills that simulate the demands of the real game, right? There's random unpredictability versus a blocked isolated skill or flow drills for that matter, which is a false environment, right? We're trying to create controlled chaos as opposed to that false environment. We're gonna train speed and I'm gonna show you some examples. If we're, if we're asking our guys to play fast, then we've got to train fast, right? So that the transfer takes place. And then once again, technique and, track and tactical execution under pressure. 
That's the development, that's the, excuse me, the definition of skill is execution under pressure that we talked about with Doc Z's book that I love so much, right? So it's challenging the comfort zones. We're targeting the struggle as a coaching staff. And the players are going to give you feedback. So practice planning, what do you think about? For me, it's player development where it's individual skills, passing, receiving, things of that nature. It's team development that involves tactics. And then it's physiology. It's conditioning and workload, right? These are the three things that we focus on when we're preparing our team in, in, uh, in the practice environment, okay? So let's talk about, let's break the three down, the player development. So it's skill development, right? And so we've already discussed the, 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 the science of skill acquisition, how it takes place. But what about this? What about position-specific skills? If you're a wing, practice in pulling the puck off the wall. If you're a center, puck protection down low, face-offs, things of that nature, right? And I remind you of that idea of alignment. When you're trying to practice these things, the more you can create specificity in, 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 in putting it under the demands of how the game's played, the transfer of the skill is gonna be, is gonna be optimal. That doesn't mean there isn't a progression that takes place where maybe you start with isolation or little or, little or control pressure or token pressure, but then you add uh, pressure and you get closer to the real game environment as you go through uh, the development of that skill. And I'll show you some examples of what I mean, right? So that's, that's player development. So then there's team development, right? And so that's tactics. There's offensive concepts, there's defensive concepts. Offensive concepts might be, you know, a middle lane drive on, a, on an uh, offensive rush. Uh, a defenseman joining the rush, a four-man attack, right? Those are offensive concepts. How do you get your defenseman involved off the offensive blue line in your in-zone offense? Those are offensive concepts. Breakouts are an offensive concept. What, what's your game plan off of initial breakout? But what about out of D-zone coverage, right? That's a transition state. So those are offensive concepts. Defensive concepts are play without the puck. It's a four-check. It's D-zone coverage. It's a neutral zone four check. It's rush coverage, right? It might even be one-on-one -on -one skills, angling and stick detail, like things of that nature that are on an individual basis that, that help in a team tactic environment. Those are defensive concepts. But what about transition concepts? And I wanted to throw this at you guys. When you think about the game, there's four states of the game. There's offense when you have the puck. There's defense when you don't have the puck. But then there's, tra there's two transition states. There's offense to defense. When you lose possession, you've got to get yourself in a defensive posture. And then there's defense to offense. When you're in, in a defensive posture and you steal the puck, now your ability to transition and take advantage of that in that attack mindset when the window of opportunity is highest. So are you practicing those four different states of the game? And we talk about that, a lot of that with our coaching staff. So then there's physiology, right? And so physiology for me is workload, it's conditioning. And I think sometimes, you know, people talk about conditioning, it's always the cardio aspect, right? But what I would challenge you guys to think about is the neuromuscular aspect of conditioning, all right? So I'm gonna share with you this term undulation, which is a form of periodization. We do this with our, with our guys. We've got a sports science department, We've got, uh, we've got technology with heart monitors and things like that on our guys every day so we can track their workloads. We call them TRIMPs, where we get numbers and, uh, and, and metrics that we can measure their workloads in practice. You guys might have not have those things at your disposal, but you can still, you can still utilize this information, right? So undulation is, is manipulating workload to allow for recovery. In other words, you can't just bag skate guys day after day after day and think that you're gonna prepare them for the game situation. So what undulation is, is it's varying workloads day to day where you give them an opportunity for their bodies to recover physically, their central nervous system, things of that nature, right? So when you look at the graph on the left side here, when the, the blue line is volume, okay, the red line is intensity. So when volume is really high, maybe intensity drops. When, when it, uh, volume is lower, you can heighten intensity, right? The graph on the right, this is a specific graph that we did with our guys 
when we did, had the return to play before we went to the bubble. This is the first seven days of our, of our mini training camp. That was 12 days long. So the blue line is volume. The green line is intensity. So if you look at the intensity, the intensity didn't vary that much through the seven days. We went three days on, a day off, four days on, a day off. Then we went five days on, right? And so this is the undulation aspect. The way we, the way we created the recovery was by manipulating the volume. So on day one, we practiced for an hour. On day two, we practiced for 45 minutes. On day three, we practiced for an hour. On day four, that's a day off or on, the, on that, that fourth day. On day four of practice, you can see we went back, we practiced for an hour and 15 minutes. On day five, we practiced a half hour less. The intensity through the practice was very similar because we're trying to train speed and things of that nature. But what we did was we manipulated the volume so that we allowed for the recovery process of our players to take place, if that makes sense, okay? So we're trying to, and, and, and we look at this throughout the whole course of the, of the season. So you can do this in a, from, on a week to week basis based on when your games are. You wanna target full recovery for your game day. You gotta allow for that to take place. You can't just bag skate guys day after day after day and think you're gonna prepare them for how the sports play, okay? So that's the difference. There's, there's a trade-off between neuromuscular conditioning and cardiovascular conditioning. If you're training skill and things of that nature, you want high execution. If, if execution's compromised for the sake of cardiovascular conditioning, okay, that's not necessarily a good thing. There has to be a little bit of it because we have to learn how to play with fatigue. But if, if there's, there's, there's going to be a point where it's so compromised that you're training a different energy system. Okay, so think of hockey in this, these terms. It's highly anaerobic in nature. I'll use the NHL, it's a 60 minute game. It takes about three hours to play the game with commercial breaks, stoppages in play, intermissions. It takes about three hours. Our best players play 18 to 20 minutes a night. When you think about it in those terms, the work to rest ratio for our best players is one to three. For most of our players, it's one to four. And in most instances, it's one to five where the work is one and the five comp component is the rest. So our goal a lot of times is to create an environment where we're trying to sustain 90 to 95% intensity and then build in rest components and then repeat, okay? So that's where, that's how we try to train. And the way we do it is through that undulation process where we're manipulating either volume or intensity so that we give our guys an opportunity to recover. Like I, my, one of my favorite quotes from Jack Latherwick, the, the strength coach that was in Minnesota, was with Herb Brooks and the Olympic teams, uh, real smart physiologist. You know, he says, no skills enhanced when too much fatigue is present. Some fatigue is okay. Too much fatigue where, where skill, ex where execution is significantly compromised is not good. And, and nobody, you're, you're just practicing bad habits at that point. Okay? I think that's an important aspect. So here's an example of a practice that we do, that, that we do in, uh, in, in Pittsburgh. I know it's hard to see because it's, it's on one slide. You guys can take a look at these after the fact, okay? This is an example of another practice that we did on our return to play during our training camp where we, went, we were u utilizing that undulation aspect. And you're gonna see a, a, a number of different things through this practice. There's gonna be some game reel drills, there's gonna be some uh, warm up stuff. There's gonna be some small games. There's gonna be some progressions where there might be some token pressure that turns into real similar game like pressure. Okay? So, for example, this is one drill that's in there. We call it the San Antonio D zone coverage. So, you wanna talk about cardiovascular conditioning. The way this works is we've got one end playing five on five in one zone. We've got another group of five waiting down the opposite end, resting, waiting for, for the defenders to come down. And then we have a, a, a group of five on the bench resting. And so the, 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 the repetition goes five on five scrimmage in zone. When the whistle blows, the offensive players, the five offensive players sprint to the other end and then they, they have to defend five on five. So now they're defending when fatigue is present, but they still have to think and execute and process the game while they're tired, 
right? Which is an important aspect of conditioning. And then at, when they're done defending, they go to the bench and they rest, okay? And it's that process. So here's what it looks like. And I hope this, th this video might be a little bit choppy, but when it's coming through on the network, but so it's five on five in zone, the black, the black squad is on offense, the gold is on defense, okay? We let it play out, it's game real, okay? Once the whistle blows, the gold get, line goes to the bench and the new line comes out and waits, the black guys track back to the defensive zone, now they gotta defend. Now it's five on five again. And they'll play it out, sometimes we'll add a second puck in there and they'll play the second puck and then when the whistle blows, the offensive guy's got a track to the other end, and it rotates. Now, we'll, we might let this run for six minutes or so, where it becomes a difficult task because guys get tired. You're on offense for 20 or 30 seconds. Now you've got to track 200 feet to your defensive zone, and now you've got to defend when you're not, you're, you're not completely fresh. So it's designed where you're on offense where you're fresh, so you've got the opportunity for skill execution with the puck, you're on defense when you're tired because you still have to think and execute and process the game when you're tired, right? It's not just a, uh, just conditioning where you put the pucks aside and you just go goal line to goal line or board to board or whatever it may be. This is a different type of conditioning, right? This is a game real scenario where you've, you, you're not separating the decision making from the actual conditioning of the sport. So that's one example. Of, of a drill that we do. I'll give you one more. This is, we call it D-zone coverage, three on two high low. It takes place where it starts with a three on two low from the top of the circles down. So the black circles are on offense there against the two gold defending defensemen. There's a gold line at the top of the circles, one of them with a puck waiting on the whistle that's gonna attack the two defending black sweaters, three against two with the other guys that are gonna track back. So this is a, this is a quick opportunity for a three on two low play to try to get a scoring chance. On the whistle, it tracks back. There's some rush coverage decisions that are made on the entry where we can talk about our rush coverage and our tracking rules with the forwards tracking back into the D zone. So we're, we're practicing the transition state and then it turns into five on five in the D zone. Here's an example. So you're going to see the, the black team, the black line is on offense. It's a three on two low. There's the scoring chance. Whistle blows. Now it's a three on two attack with black tracking back into the D zone. Now sometimes we'll spot a second puck so that we'll let it play out five on five. So now they play five on five in the zone. So that's another example of, of, a, uh, of a drill that we use a lot in practice where we're working on our different team concepts. Now these are drills, three on three, three goals in game is a puck possession game. This is a three levels, another small game, working on puck protection, passing and receiving. This is a game, a takeover game. It's another puck possession game. I've got all these that you guys have at your disposal that Paul will have for you guys as references that you guys can utilize these different types of drills. And they're all different types of drills that involve progressions. And, and like the, the first two that I showed you guys are the game specific stuff that we're talking about as far as utilizing the science of, of, of teaching the game and the game specificity so that, so that we're trying to practice how we play, okay? And so these are all different shooting drills and I'm just buzzing through these for you. I'm gonna leave these with Paul for you after the fact. So in summary, once again, these are the things we covered, right? We identified qualities of an elite player. We discussed the sky science of skill acquisition and decision-making. We identified coaching methodologies to leverage that science. We discussed practice planning and training for the modern game and the things that you guys should be thinking about, right? The, the, the physical, uh, excuse me, the player development, the team development, the physiology. I, give you, I, I challenge you guys to think about the physiology aspect, right? And the other challenge for you guys is this. Can you create an environment with a twofold objective? You've got a responsibility to develop your players and you have an understanding and a responsibility to try to win a championship at the high school level. 
And it's balancing that, those two, that in my mind, separate the great coaches at your level from the, from the, the ordinary coaches at your level. You know, these are two guys we talk a lot. I know I talked about Coach Parker at the beginning of this, but this is one of my favorite quotes. A teacher is one who makes himself progressively unnecessary. These are two guys in my life that, that have shaped not only my, my playing career and, and, and my, my philosophies as a player, but also they shape me as a person, as a coach. One of them is Coach Parker. The other one is my dad. And these guys might be the two best coaches that I ever played for in my life. So what I would say to you guys is you guys are a huge influence on the players that you're coaching. And I, I urge you to take that seriously. And like I said, Paul has all of those, those drills and stuff that you guys can, you guys can look up and use as references after the fact. Uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me, Paul's got my email or whatever. Hey, I'm, I, I, I feel so passionately about this stuff. I'm willing to help anybody that's willing to listen. And so I appreciate your time. I know this went on a little bit longer than I, I tried to buzz through it. There was a lot involved in this PowerPoint, but I, want, I, I thought they were important aspects of trying to shape and develop a coaching philosophy and create a training environment that's ideal for development and practice planning being one aspect of that. So I hope you guys enjoy the talk. If you, know, if, if you guys want to stay on for some q and I'm up for that. If you want to just blow out because we've been on for an hour here, that's your call. Paul, I'll leave it up. I'll, you can take it over here. Awesome. Awesome. Great stuff, Mike. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat. I'll throw them out there. Um, how do you teach players to skate and play with confidence, especially at the youth level? How do these lessons change as players rise to the collegiate and pro level? Well, I think, you know, once again, it's, we talked about, you know, the, the struggle being, being uh, a biological requirement to development, right? And so for me as coaches, you know, at any level, one of the things that we need to think about consciously in, is to react the right way to those mistakes, right? It's part of the process. So, you know, it's, it's trying to find that balance of uh, we're, 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 not, we're not encouraging an environment where we make a million mistakes and we become this high-risk team. But we also have to allow for an opportunity for players to express themselves and explore the game, right? And that, for me, is the sweet spot. And as you, as you go higher into the, in, uh, up the food chain, so to speak, right? There's more of an emphasis on winning, right? And there's always going to be a trade-off between winning and this idea of development, right? And so you can, you can go down that road and, and you, 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 can, you can reach both objectives. It's just finding that sweet spot where you can encourage the development process, but also um, allow for players to explore themselves and and grow in the different aspects of the game. Like I, I, when I talk to my players all the time, here's my commitment to them. And, and this is the vocabulary that I use. My commitment to them is I will find common ground with each and every player that I have. You may not get everything you want, but I will, I will work to find common ground to help you, to help satisfy you and what you want. But your, their commitment to me is they have to meet me halfway. There are certain things that are non-negotiable. We're gonna, we're gonna look the other way in certain instances, some things we're going to hold your feet to the fire. We're going to hold you accountable to. And it's finding that sweet spot. That's the challenge of coaching. I hope I helped answer that question. Yeah, great answer. Uh, Bob Concession from uh, Burlington High School. Um, this is great stuff. Can you please elaborate on how you have those conversations with guys in the American Hockey League versus NHL, especially in our environment where guys want, it, want instant gratification and want to go somewhere else if they don't get what they want? Well, it's a great question, but, and, and for me, and, and we can take it all the way down to the youth level, right? Everybody wants a kid on the triple A team right away. And, and maybe the kid's not ready for the triple A team. Maybe the kid's not ready for the varsity and he needs a year or a half a year to play at the JV level. It's not a bad thing. Maybe the kid it, isn't ready for the NHL. So he needs to play at the American league level a little bit. It's not a bad thing. It's part of the process. It's part of the process of development and maturation. And what I say to the guys is, Trust us, trust the process and trust us 
that we're going to make the best decisions that are in your best interest in the big picture, right? It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So the development process doesn't take place in a snapshot. It's a daily endeavor that, that takes place over the course of time. And so I know a lot of you guys have been in the game a long time. You've got a wealth of experience. You've had a number of players that have been in similar circumstances that that player that you're talking to has been in, right? So what I would suggest is I would share that conversation with, with him and his parents, if need be, or her and her parents, if need be. Like, trust the process. And it's, you know, it's not always about, hey, I want my kids to play in the varsity. Well, what good is it if he's a fourth line guy and he never touches the puck and he's overwhelmed and he might make, be put in a position where he can't possibly succeed. He might make a mistake and we lose the game because of it. And now we're out of the state tournament. How does that make the player feel, right? It's really about what's in the best interest of the team and the individuals. And, and that's what we do. We, we do the same thing. What's in the best interest of the player and the organization. And sometimes it might be, hey, you may practice with the varsity, but we're going to get you some games in the JV. You may play a little bit with the varsity, but then we're going to, we're going to, you're going to spend a little bit of time at the JV level, right? And we do the same thing with our guys. When, you know, we've got the business aspect with waivers and things like that, but, but when guys are young and they're on the entry-level contracts and they don't, they, they don't have to be uh, put through waivers, you know, sometimes we call guys up and down half a dozen times through the course of the year, right? And it's not because we're, it's, it's not because we're putting them through this process that doesn't make sense. It's just the opposite. We're trying to balance, hey, let's get them in, let's get them practicing with our varsity, the Pittsburgh Penguins, so they can practice at the pace with Crosby and Malkin and Latang and these guys. But I know they're not going to get a ton of playing time, so let's get them some playing time at the American League level. So, hey, maybe they practice with the varsity so they can practice with your best players. But, hey, maybe we get you in some games on the weekend at the JV level. So now you can play a ton. And, and, and it's that combination that that's gonna that's in the best interest of the individual as a player and I would just say trust the process and trust that we know what we're doing and and for me I never look at that as a bad thing it's the same thing about you know like I get a kick out of like tryouts at the youth level you know for me I I, I hate the word tryout I wish it was more it's more about placement right it's putting guys in the right circumstances to, to, to give them a chance where they can succeed, right? That's my job as the head coach. I tell our guys that all the time. My job is to put you in positions where you can be successful. If I overwhelm you, that's not in your best interest and it's not in our best interest. So I think that that whole concept takes place at all the respective levels. Awesome. Uh, back to practice planning. Um, I love how you mentioned the importance of the random drill in drill planning, random versus blocked um, flow drills. Can you take a little deeper dive on that and the importance of that? Sure. So, so we, we do flow drills sometimes in our practices, right? A lot of times we use them as warm-up drills where we give our guys an opportunity to get their heart rates up and break a sweat. So we might do a four-check skate or, or uh, we might do a breakout five-on-all where we're working on different concepts, tactical concepts of our breakout with no resistance. But as we get into the meat of the practice, we're going to do breakouts against pressure. It might be one four checker, then it's two four checkers, then it's three four checkers, then it's five on five, right? There's a progression of pressure, right? And that's what I was talking about. That's the difference between a, a blocked practice where it's flow or isolation where that's a false environment, right? And we're going to progress to a most specific real environment and that's where there's random unpredictability, variability, where decision-making is necessary, but also in the skill acquisition aspect of it, that's how the brain uh, acquires the adaptations that are necessary so skills can be successful in the game environment. If, hey, we can work on breakouts five on oh and look like a million bucks. We, look, we can look like the Oilers of the 80s. But the, if all we did was stay in a five on oh environment, it looks great in practice. It's sexy. But then you get in the game and all of a sudden it breaks down and the coaches are scratching their head. The parents are in the stands. Say, I can't believe it. I watched them in practice. They were great. Well, of course, you didn't put them in a, in a real environment. You put them in a false environment. Put them in a real environment as often as you can. Now, you can give them advantages. You can give the offense an advantage. 
Start with one four checker, work on your breakouts. Add a second four checker, keep working. Add a third four checker, right? Give them an opportunity to experience success by creating offensively dominant numbers, but keep progressing into the closer to the, to the real environment. We do it with our power play a lot. You know, we might have a five on, you know, we, we might have, we start our power play in one end. We go five on, oh, we'll give you three options with three pucks starting behind the net. Work three options on the, on the power play that we talked about. Now we're going to dump it down the ice. You, all five guys are going to go down. You're going to do a five on, oh, breakout. When you're going down for the puck, we're putting four killers in the zone. When you come back down from the power play, play breakout five on, oh, once you gain the zone, it's live. So it went from five on oh with three options to a five on oh breakout. But now once it gets in zone, now it's five on four and it's game real. And we spot pucks, right? So that's the progression that I'm talking about. We don't, we don't stay in the false environment very long. We're totally trying to progress to the most specific game real environment as often as we can so that the transfer of the skills and the tactics will be most effective. And it's not, listen, it's not always, it's not always pretty. Sometimes there's a learning process in practice that you might, you, as the coach, you might have to step back and just allow that learning process to take place. That's the problem solving aspect, right? It can look ugly at first. When you, when you first introduce a drill, it can look ugly because the players are trying to figure it out. Sometimes just stay out of the way, let that process evolve and they'll figure it out. And that's the problem solving aspect that we're talking about, right? So that's what I'm talking about when I say a blocked, uh, isolated, false environment practice versus a random, variable, controlled chaos, game-like, muddy, ugly practice. Because that's what the game's like, right? It's imperfect by nature. So we've got to create that environment. We've got to, tr we've got to create a training environment that leverages that knowledge. We want to practice how we play. Right. Uh, Dave Caruso, a um, friend of ours out of USA Hockey, asked, uh, will you have your players compete in a small area game with the same color jerseys? Why? Well, because sometimes they got to decipher on who's on their team, right? So, like I said, go back and think about the science of decision-making and what we talked about earlier in the PowerPoint, right? How, did, how does the brain take in information? Three ways. Visually auditory, somatic, right? Visually is obvious. Auditory is through hearing. We hear opponents, we hear our line mates, we communicate, we talk. We might have a certain vocabulary of phrases, of catchphrases that, that help us be predictable. And then the somatic aspect is, is the feel, right? It's the instinct. It's, I can't see him, but I can feel him off my hip. I can, I can sense. It's that sixth sense. I, I can feel them on my hip, so I'm going to try to escape the opposite way, right, to create some time and space for myself. So that's how we take in information. So when we manipulate the environment, we can, we can manipulate the, the, the information uh, gathering process that helps us to create the adaptations, right? So if I can't, if I can't see it, I've got to be able to hear it or feel it, right? And so, and maybe if I can't see it because I'm muddied by the fact that we all got the same color jerseys, now I might have to, I might have to kind of key in a little bit more specifically on who's on my team. So it, it, that, that's the process, right? That's the learning process that takes place. All right. Another great question here. Some coaches like to do line skating to work on skating fundamentals. How does that not fit into the brain learning uh, sorry, I lost. How does that not fit into the brain learning you talked about? How okay. would you work on skating? It, it's interesting play? because I, I wish I had my skills coach because he's so great. His name's Ty Hennis. He's done a lot for USA Hockey. And, and he, this guy is, uh, he's a brilliant guy. He's a chiropractor that decided he loves hockey so much. He's going to be a skills coach, but he played hockey himself at Boston college. And uh, now he's our skills coach. And, and, and he talks a lot about this stuff when developing skill, right? And so, and, and one of the things he talks about is a player's gaze. So when you're trying to develop puck skills or skating skills, you can, you can incorporate other aspects into the line skating or whatever it may be so that you, you, you change the gaze of a player. It, in other words, if you just create that environment where it's straight lines and there's, no, there's nothing in front of you, right, 
your gaze as a player might be looking down at your feet. You do that over the course of time and you're training a habit, right? That, that's the process that takes place. Same thing with puck handling. If you're going to puck handle around a cone versus maybe a player with a stick, your gaze can be down low by the puck. And, and over the course of time, maybe you, you lose the, 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 the ability to raise your gaze so you can process the whole rink. And now you can take in information with a wider uh, aspect of the rink. So let's say you're going to work on edge work or whatever it may be. And I'm okay with that. There's a time and a place for it as long as you don't get stuck at it, right? And then, and then for me, what I would suggest is, is if you do that, maybe put another line at the opposite end of the rink and have them come straight at the other guy. Or maybe have one group going down the rink lengthwise and have another group going across the rink sideways. So now, okay, they might be working on edge work or doing something like that, but they also have to process other information around them, right? So for me, that's, that's the aspect of the, that, that you're trying to get to when, you, when you're working on skill development in any aspect, right, is, is decision-making. Don't separate decision-making or information processing, even though you're developing a certain isolated skill. Awesome. Uh, back to the brain here. Do you test for the necessary brain-based knowledge that you were looking for, or do you observe this as you watch players play? Most of the time, what we do is, is it's, uh, is like when, when I watch, I'm, we're trying to challenge this. We're trying to target the struggle, right? We're challenging comfort zones. So as a coach, you design a drill. You say, I, I envision it going a certain way, right? And we've all done this, but then you go out on the ice and it doesn't go the way you think it should go, right? So I think you're going to get just as much feedback from them as you're giving them, right? So once you, once you explain a drill or design a drill or whatever, you explain it to the players, watch. Watch how it takes place. And then you're going to get feedback on, is it accomplishing your objective? Maybe if you overwhelm them, you might have to simplify. If it's too easy, you might have to make it more complex, right? You've got to target the struggle. Remember, you've got to create an environment where you're at the edges, where, where constantly at the edges of their ability. That's the, that's the requirement of the, of the learning process, right? So, you know, you're going to get feedback just simply by observing the drill and watching it. The same thing I would say to you when you're, when you're talking about conditioning, like I showed you that San Antonio five on five drill, right? So I watch that. Once I think the execution is getting compromised significantly, I stop the drill, right? And hopefully over the course of time, as we get in better shape, we can, that drill can sustain itself longer. But I stop the drill. The other thing I do is I track. Like I, I take notes, right? So I track, we track all our practices. We have notes that on, on, on how it went and what we did and how long and all that stuff. I track everything that we do so that next year we can look back. We have it all electronically, right? So we can my video guy has it. So, so we can, we go back, we, we track, like I said to you guys, we have software program where we've got GPS te technology and we track everything from heart rates to accelerations and decelerations, how fast guys skate, how many transitions they have, uh, uh, skin temperature. We, we track a number of different metrics every single day with our guys. And so we have objectives that we try to meet physiologically every day. And we do that based on our discussions as a coaching staff and we bring our strength and conditioning guys in and we're talking about that undulation process, right? So that, hey, maybe we got three games and four nights coming up at the end of the week. We play, you know, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, and it's Monday, right? So I've got to have an understanding of, hey, we got to prepare our guys for this three games and four nights. How am I going to, how am I going to manage these practices leading up to and in between so that we can get better every day. But I target those days so that uh, physiologically they're at their peak and they're ready. Right. So th th those are the things that we do. I don't know that you can t test quote unquote brain capacity or whatever, but, but we test a lot of metrics. We, we measure a lot of metrics for our guys physiologically so that we can keep track of where our workloads are at. We know how long people, uh, stay in certain uh, 
heart rate zones, for example. You know, we know max heart rates and how quickly they recover and things of that nature that, that help us uh, make the better decisions moving forward. Awesome stuff. Uh, we have a few more questions. Coach, you mind taking a couple more questions? No, not at all. Awesome. Well, we, uh, before we do that, I want to just introduce Dave Fizzano. Dave is our um, president of the Coaches Association. He's the head coach at Braintree High School. And Dave, I don't know if you wanted to say a couple words before we have a couple more questions for Coach. Yeah. Hi, Mike. Uh, just on behalf of the association, I, I want to say thank you for your time and your effort. And um, more importantly, your continued support of high school hockey in Massachusetts. It means a lot to the coaches. Um, and, you know, I know that was a big part of your life as you spoke earlier. But um, once again, thank you from all of the coaches um, in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, uh, just thanks for everything you do d daily. Uh, and on behalf of the association, um, Dan Connolly will be delivering, hand delivering um, a gift certificate to your favorite restaurant uh, from, from all of um, us guys on the association. Um, so again, thank you very much for your time. Great webinar and um, really appreciate it. My thank pleasure, you. Dave. The, thanks for your kind words. I, you know, what I'll tell you guys is, you know, when, when I was at BC High, I played, for two, I played for two coaches, Jim Gormley and Bob Hayes. Both of those guys had a significant impact on my life. They were great people. Uh, you know, they were a lot like Jack. They weren't warm and fuzzy, you know, but it, it's amazing to me, you know, and this is another thing that Jack said to me, you know, I, I was asking him for his advice when I first started coaching. He said to me, you know what, Sully? He goes, he goes, let me just tell you one thing. Before players want to know what you know, they want to know that you care. And, and th those words for me, I've never forgotten. When, when you can push guys really hard when they know you're doing it for the right reasons. And you're doing it in their best interest to try to help them be, you know, reach their maximum potential. And listen, we're coaching a game. It's not a nice game. It's violent. You know, it's, I tell people all the time, it's not for the faint of heart, man. You know, it just isn't. If, if you don't have skin on you, this isn't the right sport for you, you know, and it's the same thing as a coach. So, you know, like I tell my guys, like, I try to let them know how much I care about them. I do it through my actions. I do it through uh, how I treat them. But just like Jack was and Bob Hayes was and Jim Gormley was, you know, I'm not always the most warm and fuzzy guy either. But, you know, you got to be demanding if you're going to challenge comfort zones. But what I would say to you guys is you guys are at such an important aspect of the development process. I can't tell you how impactful you are in shaping these players to get to the next levels. And those that don't play at the next levels, you're shaping them for becoming the young men and women that they, they're going to be when they graduate and they end up in the workforce, right? A lot of the attributes that we're taking out of the game are transferable. I, I do a lot of leadership stuff in, in the business community in Pittsburgh all the time. And I, and I, you know, interact with a lot of CEOs. And one of the things they tell me is, you know, what we love about your game and, and about what you, what you talk about is, is all of this stuff is transferable in life, right? So, don't, don't minimize your impact or your influence and in what you do. It's vitally important. And guys like me that are at the higher levels, you know, we're, we're the benefactors of your hard work. And so I thank you for that because we wouldn't have the players that we have at our levels if they didn't go through the process at the level that you're at to get them to where they are. So uh, it, it's, uh, we really appreciate it as well. No, thank you. Uh, I got a question here from Pat Kennedy, and it, it, it leads into one of the questions I had about the limited. We know that at the NHL level now, there's limited practice time. And um, Pat wants to know uh, how, as the head coach, do you adjust to a practice when your players seem to be fighting the puck a bit or may not have the motivation that day or might may, may be just tired physically or mentally? Well, it's a great question, and it's hard to give you a specific answer because I think, once again, this is the art of coaching, right? It's... Uh, there are sometimes if we struggle, like I'll give you an example. Sometimes after a day off, when we come back, physically we might feel pretty good because we had a day off, but our execution isn't good. Our hands aren't great at the beginning or whatever. Sometimes I just look the other way and I just allow the drill to continue and, and, and give them time to capture the execution. But there's only a certain amount of time. If it doesn't happen, then the whistle blows and they hear from me, right? But there are other times if we're sloppy and we're not committed, uh, that's a different story. And then I might blow that down right away and, and you know, and pull them all in. And, uh, 
you know, and give them a piece of my mind, you know? And once again, I try to do it the right way. It's not about, it's not about ridiculing or whatever it may be. It's about, you know, it, the, the, the word I like to use and, and it is inspire. You know, I, I know when people talk about coaches, they talk about motivation all the time. You know, the best coaches I ever played for were inspiring. They inspire you, you know, and, and I think that's a way, it encompasses way more than, than motivating you know, because motivating has a certain uh, connotation to it that might imply, you know, the accountability aspect, you know, inspiring people has, has a certain uh, aura about that word, where it's more than just motivating, it's more than just accountability, it's, it's, it's compelling people to take ownership for what for themselves and their contribution. And, and back to that, that slide I had with control and the controllables, right? Attitude, effort, execution. Those are the things that we can control every day and make sure you control it. And if you don't, you're going to hear from me because that's just how we go about our business in Pittsburgh. That's what's required. That's non-negotiable. Awesome. Okay, we're going to uh, have one more question here. Time's getting long here. We don't want to take too much more of your time. Uh, Derek Geary has a great question here. I'm, I'm sure you can relate to this. How do you practice special teams without half the team sitting on the bench, losing the momentum of practice and feeling left out? Also, usually at high school level, the best penalty killers also play on the power play. Well, what I would suggest is you can do it a couple of different ways. You can take a group of power play guys down one end and utilize the other half with other guys. You know, you could take, uh, you, let's, say you, let, let's say you have two power play units. You could take two power play units down one end with a handful of penalty killers, and you'd have a, a handful of guys down the other end, and you can work on skill stuff, right? Tactics, whatever. Um, that's one way. You could take a group of five power play guys with some killers, leave them down the other end with the big group if you wanted to create more opportunity and play a small game, for example down the other end where you, you're, you're getting players involved and they're developing skills through the process. And then maybe you spend, you know, four or five, five, six minutes with your first power play. Then you send them down the other end. You bring a second power play unit down. If you do it five on five, I would suggest there are times when you're going to use your power. If you want your best players on your power play, then use the other guys killing penalties, get them involved too. And then if you want to, if your objective is more about your penalty kill, then use your, some, of, some of your best players on your penalty kill and use the other guys, some of your best players on your power play. So there's a number of different ways you can manipulate the practice environment to keep everybody involved, right? But, but th those are just a few examples that, that, uh, that we do at our level to try to, to, try to keep everybody involved. And, and I got one last question. That young Mike Sullivan from Marshfield, Massachusetts, hoisting the Stanley Cup over his head as a head coach. You said it was one of the most impactful things that happened in your life. Can you elaborate on that for a second? Well, it, it's uh, like, it's hard for me. Like I get emotional when I talk about it, you know, it's, it's really hard for me to, to uh, articulate in words what it's meant to me and my family. And, you know, like I, I, I'll go back to my dad and you guys saw the picture of it with the Stanley Cup on my kitchen table, you know, and, uh, you know, my dad passed away a couple of years ago. He was such a huge part of my life. And, you know, the last couple of years before he passed were the years we won the Stanley Cup. And he stayed with me my whole, the whole time at my house. So he went to all the games. In between days, we'd have a cigar and a beer and play cribbage. He loved to play cribbage. You know, we'd play cribbage and have a cigar and a beer in between in the off days, in between days. He came to our practices. When we won the Cup, he came down on the ice in his wheelchair. We had our parade. He was... We had pickup trucks in our parade in Pittsburgh. There was, you know, a million people and, you know, screaming Sully, Sully. They thought they were screaming for him. It was hilarious, you know. <laughs> but, it was, but, you know, that, that like that experience, it, it not only has, you know, has given me the opportunity to enjoy it, but I use my dad as an example, but my kids and my wife and, it, you know, my, my brothers and sisters, uh, it's, it's been just such a, an unbelievable experience for all of us. And then from a career standpoint, well, it's, it's just changed my life. Like I told you guys, I was 35 years old. I was a coach of the Bruins, you know, and I was sitting on top of the world. It was my dream job. 
uh, with, with the team that I grew up worshiping. And, you know, it was also my first coaching experience. So I was, you know, I was green, so to speak. And I will tell you, you know, 15, 17 years later, I'm a very different coach today than I was when I was coaching the Bruins. Not that I, not that I didn't think we did a, a commendable job, but you go through life experiences and coaching experiences and along the way. And it, I'm not like any of you guys, you learn through those experiences, right? They're both successes and failures. So I'm a very different coach today, but the, the Stanley cup from a career standpoint, I finally, I was 10 years as an assistant coach. I thought I was going to get another opportunity to be a head coach. This was my career choice, right? So those words that Jack Parker said to me, you sure you want to do this? They were resonating in my ears, man. When I was, when I was an assistant coach for, I'm like, man, am I ever going to get another opportunity? I might not get another opportunity. I feel like I'm a better coach now than I was when I was the head coach and I'm not going to get another opportunity. Some coaches don't get that opportunity. And I got it. And I can't tell you how grateful I am to Jim Rutherford, our general manager and the Pittsburgh Penguins and, Mario Lemieux and Ron Burkle. And I can't tell you how grateful I am to my players. I tell them that all the time, Crosby and Malkin and Latang. like they have changed my life in so many ways. Financially, I finally have established myself as a head NHL coach. I'd like to think when I get fired by the Penguins and who knows, you know, like we're, we're, once we sign on the dotted line, the clock starts ticking. You guys know that we're all hired to get fired. It's just the nature of the beast. And so I hope, I hope that body of work that, that I've been able to accomplish in Pittsburgh will provide another opportunity for me to continue doing something I love. And that's being a head coach at the high, the highest level in the game. So it's just, it's changed my life in so many ways. And I've had the opportunity to share it with the people that I love and care about. And, and I just can't tell you how satisfying it, it, it's been for all of us, but it's hard, man. Like it, you know, it, it, I have this insatiable appetite to want to win it again because it was, it's such an unbelievable feeling and all of it that goes along with it. And, and, you know, the last couple of years, we've kind of bowed out a little bit early and it, man, it stings, you know, it's just, I'm dying, I'm chomping at the bit to get, to get back in the finals again, to, to get a shot at it. Like it's, it's the hardest trophy in sports. I don't care what anybody says. You've got to go through four teams that are really, really good teams. It's the hardest hockey you'll ever play. It's physical like that. You know, I remember, I remember in 2016 when we won the cup in San Jose and we, we went through, I, I remember walking into the locker room and, and you guys can envision this. It's a small locker room in San Jose. We're in the away dressing room and the guys are in, and they're still in their, their equipment from the waist down. They got their shoulder pads and everything off. They're dripping with sweat. They're drenched in sweat and booze and champagne and beer and, you know, and their, their girlfriends and wives and, and family are standing up on the bench seats where they normally sit in the locker room and they're singing, we are the champions and there's champagne spraying everywhere. And I remember just looking in and I'm looking at the players. I'm looking at Crosby. He's got this scraggly beard. You know, he's got a cut over his eye. His nose is like this way. He's got a cut on his cheek on this side. You know, and, and I'm like, we look like, a, you know, with, with, with all due respect to the military, I, I don't want to minimize what they do, but I'm like, we look like we just went through a concentration camp. You know, their faces are gaunt, pale white, you know, and, and this is like June 11th, you know. And so that's the sacrifice that these guys go through to, to, to win it. And, and I just can't tell you how hard it is, but I will also tell you that the best part of it is the journey. Like, it's an unbelievable feeling to go to go through it with the players is incredible. Like I'm choked up when I, when I talk about it, cause it's, it's emotional, you know, it's just, for me, it's, it just, it kind of rekindles all those feelings and, and memories that, you know, and it wasn't all apple pie and ice cream. Everybody remembers the highlights, but Hey, there were times we were down in the conference finals, you know, three games to two to, to Tampa and we had to go to Tampa for game six. We win game six, we win game seven, we play in the finals. Like, Anything could have happened in that game six. We could have lost. We could have been out. You know, they get the first goal, and our and our video guy saw us calls the offside. That where guy had a skate lifted up four inches. If he doesn't call the offside, they score the first goal. It could have been a series changer. You know, like that. There's such a fine line between winning and losing. That's why it's so hard to win. But it's an unbelievable. It's just changed my life in so many ways. I can't even explain. It. Well, Coach, you've been such a tremendous example for all of us, and we, uh, we appreciate your time so much. And 
I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Tommy McDonald, who I know was a big help in connecting us together. And I know Tom McDonald's on the call uh, tonight. And thank you, Tom. And, hey, man, uh, I he was back in the day. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, so thank you, Coach. Um, and as uh, you guys can see in the chat uh, that Liz has posted some links to this um, presentation, we will share the PowerPoints with you guys so you can check out the videos. Um, and I want to thank the association for entrusting me to um, do this tonight. Uh, I appreciate that, Dave Fasano and John McGuire. Um, guys, I don't know if you have anything to close it out uh, with Coach or um, and Liz Sullivan. Liz, so, sorry, Liz Cohen. Thank you for your uh, help on the the um, the production of this. It was uh, it was amazing. And, and Coach, again, you know, I'll, over an hour and a half into this, I, we could do this all night, but really indebted to you. And I know the coaches really appreciate it. It's it's my pleasure. You know, you know what I love about hockey people is we could talk hockey for hours. You know, oh. it's it's so great. You know, the only thing we're missing is going to a bar where we can uh, we can draw up the, the the drills on a bar napkin. You know, like right. for me, that's that's hockey. I, I I could talk all night with you guys. I know you guys share the same passion that I do. I'm I'm lucky. I'm one of the lucky ones because I do it as a profession. But I feel like I've never had a job in my life. It's oh. uh, I pinch myself sometimes. I'm I'm lucky and I appreciate it, but. You know, the hockey world's a small world. And, uh, you know, I think everybody, everybody comes from similar backgrounds. And, and we're all in it for the same reasons, because we love it. So I, I just want to say I wish you guys all the best. I hope some of the stuff that, uh, that I shared with you tonight can help you. We'll, I hope it will provoke some thought uh, and maybe help you guys evolve your own philosophies and your, and your convictions as a coach. And like I said, my, uh, I'm always available. You guys want to ask me questions or whatever, let me know if, if uh, shoot me an email or whatever i'd be more than happy to respond appreciate it coach fuzzy mac you guys have anything you're, you're muted john there you go mike thank you this was great and i really appreciate your time really appreciate it thank you my pleasure yeah and uh, and coach good luck uh Hopefully you guys start sooner than later. Yeah, thanks. I hope so. It's uh, it's a crazy crazy time we're in right now. You know, hopefully we'll uh, we'll all get back to some sense of normalcy. Right, right. All right. Well, thanks again, and we'll uh, we'll we'll catch you down the road. Okay, guys. My pleasure. Thanks. Appreciate your time.